Okay, so our final speaker of the session is Sandeep Silwal. Uh, Sandeep is a really impressive PhD student at MIT uh, who's currently on the job market. Um, his research is pretty broad, but uh, recently with a focus on the intersection of machine learning and classical algorithms. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Sandeep. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. So yeah, thanks for uh, being here. I know it's late afternoon, but hopefully this will be entertaining. Uh, today I'll be talking about Computing distances to private data sets. This is joint work with, with, with the Artors, Zinan, Sepede, and Jakub. And I didn't put my photo here because I thought you'd want to get an up to date photo of me. So why? Space is blank. All right. So uh, let's see. Right. So let's say you're a hospital, okay? And you have a bunch of data of patients that had uh, COVID. And one day, oh, and, 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 and of course, right, this data is private. And one day, let's pretend you're also a very cute dog, but one day uh, you, uh, you feel very sick and you wanna know if you have uh, COVID or not, right? So what's the natural thing to do? Well, you might go to the hospital and take a scan, lung scan. And what you really wanna do is, you know, how similar is my scan to these prior patients that had uh, COVID, right? To these uh, private uh, data points. So this is the question that we try to understand this, uh, paper. And of course, there are two natural requirements. First, we want to preserve some notion of privacy with respect to, you know, these prior patients, right? Like we don't want to post their information on Facebook or Twitter, but also we want an accurate answer, right? Uh, we, we actually want to know if we are very similar to this set of patients that have uh, COVID. So now, okay, so now let's formalize the problem, right? Let's extract a clean mathematical problem um, out of this. So first, right, uh, you know, instead of having pictures and lung scans, let's have the vectors, right? So you can imagine the vectors are, you first take your lung scans and pass it through some model. It probably will not give you these like particular numbers, but you know, let's just pretend <laughs> these are our vectors. Or, you know, there are some features that you extracted from images and so on. And you can, and let's pretend our query is also a vector. Like, you know, you take your scan, you pass it through a model, you get a vector. And now you wanna measure the similarity between a query vector and a set of endpoints, let's say, in our D dimensions. And now what do I mean by similar, right? Uh, well, let's pretend we have some notion of similarity a function. It just takes two data points, or, you know, two images or two whatever, and outputs how similar they are. For example, a distance function, like L2, L1, or even a kernel function, right? Or, you know, or you can imagine even more complicated things. So our goal is to actually, is to compute, you know, for our query Y, what is the sum of F of X comma Y for X in our data? And you can imagine, you know, we can normalize it by the size of the data to compute some notion of average similarity, okay? But this is a problem that we want to solve. And now, what do I mean by privacy and, and, and accuracy? Well, let's formalize it a little bit more. So instead of, you know, the hospital being some abstract, um, entity, we're going to call it our um, 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 algorithm. What is this input? Well, its input is the private things that it has, right? And what, what do we want it to output? We want to output a data structure, okay, uh, D. And D is going to be private with respect to the data X. So I'm not going to be too formal about what I mean in privacy, but, uh, but essentially uh, D is going to sort of respect, you know, some notion of privacy. And on any query y, the goal of d is to compute the sum, okay? And the really key point is we want the summary or this data structure d to itself be private. So we can post it on Twitter if we want to. You know, we can post the description of d on Twitter. And that's really important because that actually will allow us to compute arbitrarily many queries, right? If the data structure itself is private, then we can just compute as many queries as we want. So, you know, we can keep using it for the next five months or year and so on. And this might be a little weird, right? Like, how can we have privacy if we're, if we, if you, you know, how can we have any notion of privacy if we're allowed to uh, query infinitely many times? I guess. Right. So uh, you can imagine, I'll, I'll be more precise about what okay. this, what functions f we consider, but you can pretend f is like the 
distance between X and Y, and we want to compute the average distance. You know, so if the average distance is very small, right, in some sense, then that means I probably likely have uh, COVID. So, so going back to my point, right, like how can it be that the data structure itself will be very private? Well, we're going to give up on something, which is accuracy. We're not going to be correct all the time, but, you know, most of the time it will be correct. So one example is, you know, if the data structure always outputs the answer 42, right? That's my data structure. Well, you know, then it's always private, right? It's always saying 42, but it's not very uh, useful. It's not very accurate. So the question, so now we've demonstrated, right? There is some point on this sort of accuracy privacy trade-off, right? Which is just say 42 all the time. So, in, so now we have one point on the curve. What is the best that we can do, right? Okay, cool. So now just to you know, say it in a different word, in, in a different way. So the input to our problem is this private data X set of endpoints in D dimension. Some notion of prem, um, privacy, I'm gonna, you know, epsilon. I'm not gonna be too formal, but it's some, notion, it's some way of measuring how private you are and a similarity function we care about. And the goal is to output a data structure that itself is private. And what does the data structure do, right? It wants to compute this thing and we uh, measure its accuracy through you know, expected error, let's say. And what is the expectation over? Well, the data structure itself is gonna have some internal randomness, right? We're gonna flip some coins to create it. And this is the expectation is over the randomness uh, that we used. Okay, so this is the formal problem. Um, right, so like I said, we, we're interested in the trade-offs between error and privacy. And I'm not actually not gonna define what I mean by privacy. And from the rest of the talk, like I'll even pretend epsilon doesn't exist. But it, intuitively, it's we're using this notion of, or we are using this notion of differential privacy. And intuitively, it's like, we can't really tell if a particular data point was in X or not. And the, you know, and the smaller epsilon we choose, the more stringent our requirements are. So that's all, I, that's, um, all I'll say. And I'm sure many people are familiar with sort of the formal notions, but they don't really uh, matter for the sake of the talk. Okay, so this is our problem. Uh, okay. So now let me talk about what specific functions that we consider. So of course, you know, if the function f is something crazy, then we can't really hope to do anything. But hopefully the function, the similarity function we care about has enough maybe geometric structure that we can um, exploit, okay? So just one quick notation before I talk about the exact functions. Like I said, we, want, we care about this expected absolute error, right? And the way I'm gonna measure error is, some, we're going to have some multiplicative error and some additive error, right? M and A. And ideally, we want both of these terms to be really, very close to zero, right? The closer to zero they are, the, the better our guarantees are. Okay. So like I said, all the notation is there. So the first set of functions we care about are distance functions. So you can imagine things like the L1 distance or the L2 distance. And this, is actually, this was actually considered uh, previously in a, a previous work. So it turns out we can actually, we can get much better um, error trade-offs than previously known. It doesn't really matter what the previous error, error was, but you can see like it's some large factor that depends on the size of the data set and you know, the dimension. Whereas for us, we can actually get much smaller additive error at the cost of uh, a little bit of multiplicative error as well. So you know, we can specify any parameter alpha, maybe say 0.1, so we can get, you know, maybe 1% multiplicative error, but the additive error will be much smaller than uh, what, what, uh, what we could get before. And it turns out uh, if you have a result for L1, a result for the L2 distance actually follows pretty naturally. But we also consider a more broad class, sorry, yes. Sorry, true was not normalizing. Yeah, tr true was not normalizing. Right, yeah, ex exactly, yeah. So. Um, so that's the cool thing, right? Like our additive error doesn't depend on n. So if you normalize it, the additive error is going to zero. Yeah, true itself will blow up. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So so one thing you can do is just divide by n, and you know all the things will get divided by n. But for some reason, I didn't divide by n. Yeah. But we can also consider more complicated classes of functions, like this kernel function, right? So some some beast, right? E to the negative distance. You know, what the heck, you know. And this was, this, is, this was also studied in prior works. Here we actually match the error, but we actually have a caveat, or we, we, get, we get some gains, which is, you know, 
you know, uh, at least math wise, theoretically, we can be much faster if the dimension is large. So if you want additive error, let's say alpha, you know, 0.1, but the uh, dimension is huge, huge, then we don't want these two factors to be multiplying. We actually want to uh, separate them. And this is what we can do. And for other classes of functions, we actually get the first uh, private data structures to uh, compute this query. Okay, and this is just a small sample of the functions that we can handle. So like I said, the exact bounds don't matter, just that people had, were interested in this question before. And for many functions, we get the best uh, and new results, okay? But the really the, the thing that I really want to um, emphasize is, you know, it, it seems like, okay, there's a whole bunch of different functions, a bunch of bounds, but it turns out that everything is actually connected to one thing. So I, I really want to emphasize, okay, what the heck do all these functions and results have in common, okay? So it turns out there's one viewpoint that combines everything. Yes. Oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. So the, wait, so there's no uh, no. Uh, so there's some log factors, log n factors hiding. So I'm just suppressing all log factors. But besides that, there's no. Right. So there's some n factors that depend when you create the data structure. But once the data structure is created, there's no. Yeah. yeah. And this, so is it, is it important? Is it minus or minus? Uh, it's it's not. Uh, it's not important, yeah. That part is not important, yeah. You can do squared, cubed, 10th, pi power, maybe. Cool, um, sorry, okay, cool. Okay. Yeah, you can choose any alpha. Right. Right, so um, there is some fundamental limits that I'm hiding. So for instance, for these bounds, it turns out you have to assume the data set size is bigger than some function of you know, this additive error and epsilon that you want. So I'm hiding that. And in these bounds, there's some epsilons floating around too. Um, but here uh, you can pick any alpha less than one. Right there. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, so the exact bounds don't matter. Just like, I just wanna show you the power of this one very simple idea. And look, you know, this one idea gets me this entire table. So I think that's kind of cool. So there's only one um, idea here, which is the connection between privacy and sublinear um, algorithms. Okay, and I think it's pretty cool. Okay, so why, why, okay? So that's the main question, why? So let me give you a high level template of the algorithm design that we did. It's gonna be super vague and not like rigorous at all, but this is the same template that we use for all these different functions. And this template kind of serves as a reduction between you know, sublinear, or I forgot the way reductions, how you say it, but essentially sub between sublinear algorithms and private, private algorithms. So it's like, if you have a sublinear algorithm, somehow you can turn it into a private algorithm. Okay, so, so what is it? So in the first step, let me just create a data structure to solve this query problem, right? Ignoring privacy. But I, would, I really want the data structure to have sublinear query time. That's gonna be super important. So you can, you know, you can imagine the data structure just like an array of numbers, right? Like in the RAM model, for instance, right? There's some array somewhere and a bunch of numbers in every cell. The next step is we're gonna add noise to every entry of this array that defines our data structure. So you notice, you know, some bits got flipped. I'm not gonna say how we add the noise, but we add it in a way that introduces privacy, whatever that means. And then we're gonna just use the noisy data structure to compute the query, right? So. So why is this uh, helpful? Oh yeah, and one key point is of course, you know, like I said, this is a very vague outline. There's, you know, step one obviously requires a lot of work, right? You can't just get sublinear algorithms uh, for free, but let's let's ignore that part. And the, the reason this framework works really well is because, is because of the following. We know D has a sublinear query time, right? That means when we, when we, when we try to answer a query, we only look at very few entries of this very few memory cells, let's say, or very few entries of the array. But the point is, since we've added noise to every entry, we're only looking at a very, very small chunk of the noise. So that means we don't accumulate a lot of noise, which is good for um, the accuracy, right? So somehow there's like this direct connection between sublinear query time and having good um, the, um, the accuracy. And hopefully that like a high level idea, you know, uh, makes sense. Uh, yeah, so like I said, that means we have some hope to get small error, okay? 
So the main point of this paper is just to follow this template and try to figure out what are the right sublinear substructures, right, to extract for each, uh, each like function class that we're considering. So let me just go through some brief bullet points, right? I'm not gonna be too specific, but you'll see like there's some really interesting things going on. And, and, not, and some of these are not very deep, but I think pretty cute. So for instance, right, the L1 distance function, right? What is like sublinear about the L1 distance function? Well, well, it decomposes into one dimensional problems, right? There's, you know, by definition almost. And right, we know from computational geometry that every one dimensional problem can be so solved by some sort of tree. Doesn't matter what problem it is. It's in one dimension, there's a tree. And trees usually have, you know, very, very sublinear query time, right? So that fits the uh, template and we're good, right? And then, you know, and now if I give this as like an intro algorithms homework, right? Solve this problem using a one dimensional tree. I'm sure, you know, most people, most undergrads could probably uh, figure this out. What about more complicated uh, functions? What is the sublinear structure there? Let's say for these uh, kernels, for these types of functions, we prove a new, we prove new dimensionality uh, reduction results. So we say, okay, if our data points is in n, n points in d dimensions, well, the sublinear structure is we can actually reduce the dimension to much, much smaller. And, and the point is, right, uh, if you have smaller dimensions, then somehow you should get, be getting better error because this is, you know, it's uh, you, you have to add less noise because you know you can represent the data in a more uh, succinct form, and just by taking our dimensional reduction results and this prior work, it actually just automatically implies faster prior work. And lastly, for new functions that were not considered before, we actually uh, reduce these to other prior functions that we know we have private data structures for, and really the transformation is uh, the sublinear part, meaning you know we can write these these kernels as a sublinear combination of other kernels that we know. And sublinear meaning sublinear, like the number of terms in this combination. Like, you know, I said, write this function as some, some linear combination of functions that look like this up to some error. And the number of terms used is so sort of logarithmic in the error parameters. And that's like sublinear enough. And that's the sublinear structure that we're using. Okay. So hopefully, right, like I said, in this template, part one really requires, you know, is like the interesting stuff, but once we isolate it, you know, we have different tools to tackle it. And this template actually is very powerful and gives us lots of new uh, results. And lastly, I wanna end, yeah, so, yeah, so this is like the end of the technical part, like no more math after this. Uh, any any uh, question? Okay, cool. So lastly, I wanna end with a nice uh, looking plot. So it turns out some of our ideas are not just Fun to, uh, fun to look at, but also they can be implemented. So here, what is the experiment? Here, this is some private image classification experiment. We have a bunch of classes, right? And we and given some new point, we wanna figure out which class does it belong to. And you can pretend these are vectors, like you know, there's class one and class two, there are vectors, a new point comes, and we wanna say which class does it belong to. And let's say the points in the you know, class one and class two are private. Like we wanna do some private classification. So one natural way to do this is right, right? Pick a suitable similarity function, compute, you know, create these private data structures, and just say, okay, compute these similarity values, average similarity values, and just pick the one that has the largest similarity values, right? So this requires no deep learning training at all. You just need good uh, embeddings to begin with. And if you pick the similarity function well enough, and it turns out you can literally pick any similarity function, um, L2 kernels, they work just about the same. They're actually, so it turns out it's very, very fast. So this blue triangle is essentially our, you know, the, in, the, the runtime of our entire um, procedure. Whereas this, the current uh, approach in sort of private uh, ML training, what they do is they do this, uh, you know, differentially private gradient descent, where they just add a little bit of noise in every gradient step. And it turns out it takes us like a very, very, very long time to get uh, good results. So one caveat is of course, like, if you do this, it's a bit, you know, this private training is very powerful. So you do get much higher results, like maybe 5% higher. But right, this, this simple procedure of this like private data structure already gets you most of the way there. And it's, you know, like 5,000 times uh, faster, doesn't require any GPUs, uh, you know, and even like an incompetent person like me can actually uh, implement it. Okay. So yeah, hopefully, yeah, yeah. 
uh, like I said, yeah, the ideas are um, implementable as well. Um, that's all I had prepared and happy to take any questions. Thanks. Are there any other questions? So I, I guess, yeah, it's, it's really nice and surprising that you, you don't have this dependence on N. And I was wondering, I mean, uh, so for example, if you have something like a Gaussian kernel, right? So N initially can be very large, like, you know, you can even have a net like with exponential and D many points. And then really the contribution might just come from one point in your data set. Right. So how do you somehow get around this uh, issue and get some, some data structure with just, you know, some right. dependence on D and not... Right. So, so I would say like even beyond this five-year work, just like that problem as this on its own has been well studied. It's called kernel density estimation. And it turns out the reason you can get around this is you, you tolerate some additive error. So you say like, I want my answer to be correct up to plus or minus 0.1. So really like somehow if there is a large contribution, you'll see it. If there's no large contribution, you'll get some noise and you won't know, you know, um, but I, I can just give you a high level of how these algorithms work. Essentially, there's some nearest neighbors thing happening, which is, you know, you get a point. Essentially, you, you only want to compute these sums over the things that are close in space to you because they have the largest contribution. So that's why these like sublinear things are possible. Yeah. So yeah, at least for the kernels, there's some nearest neighbor uh, magic going on to uh, make it possible. Um, I had a question about the plot. Was that... That was just for the query time or that was for uh, this? Oh, sorry. I forgot one last slide, which is, uh, uh, I like animals. So I said, okay, let's, let's stretch afterwards. Cause it's been a long, long day. Um, uh, is this, uh, so for, for them, uh, for us, you can say it's like query construction time and query time. Essentially it's like, uh, construction time is essentially free. Query time is essentially free for them. This plot is actually just, the uh, construct like essentially you, you have to train a model and until the model is trained enough, then it won't give you good answers. So just like, it just takes a very, very long time to train. Yeah. But, but for us, you can say it's construction time and query time. Um, yeah, so uh, I just want some uh, uh, details about this thing. So uh, you had, uh, you have a vector for every image in your data set, right. you made it private mm -hmm. and then you uh, queried it by uh, taking a query Im uh, query image and putting it in the same representation and then doing your method? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, so what is the deep learning magic SOTA algorithm that's much worse than this? This So this is like these uh, yellow and green curves. So right. these are like based on DP uh, SGD. So oh, essentially- Training a model on DP SGD. Yeah, training model, yeah. So that's why I meant my magic. So they you train like some resonance model on using DP SGD for a really long time. You get some incremental gains like over the long term. You know, if you- you know, yeah, we'll but, have... you, but but okay, the two things are solving different problems. DPSGD is to keep the data private from any model trainer. And you have kind of uh, uh, assumed there's a powerful model trainer that doesn't care about privacy. And then, you know, you're just using it on top. They're, they're different problems. So actually like this, this paper actually, so we start with some embedding, right? And then yeah, we're, but... we're creating this private data structure on top of the embeddings. Right, but the thing is, the thing that generates that embedding, does right. that need so to be actually, private or not? These papers start with the embeddings as well. They don't start training from scratch. They start with the embedding from this large model. Like that's like uh, the input and then they do DPSGD on the embeddings. So we're just like, we're saying, just let's just cut it there. Let's just take the embeddings. So yeah. So in some sense, they have access to the same power. Yeah, but if you, okay. if you already have an embedding, why do you need to do further DPSGD on it? Okay, uh, never mind. I think, it, yeah, I'll take it off. Okay, sure. Is this plot for one uh, query or is it amortized over? Right. Uh, so uh, for us, it's like some average value. For them, this is just like the time it takes to train the model. So like this is not even taking in, in inference time into account. This is just like how long it takes to train the model until like you get that, you know, on average, that, that much accuracy. But if you made this plot for training and then a million queries, would it look significantly different? Uh, it might not be like 10 cube, it might be 10 squared, but just okay. like, <laughs> like this is really just running, you know, a couple of vector calculations on your computer, which is fast. Right. This is still like inferencing like a 
large. I mean, it's still not that huge model, but you still have to inference. Right. But that that's that will still be like hundred times slower, probably. All right. I think we're gonna go to break. So uh, we'll take the rest of the questions offline. Um, let's thank all the speakers one more time.